Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Anish Koshi. I teach at the English and Foreign Languages University, Hyderabad. This is the second of three modules as part of the course on grammatical categories that we have on the topic of clitics in the course in linguistics. In this particular module, you will be introduced to different types of clitics. But before we move into a discussion of clitics, let me just recollect for you what we had talked about in the previous module where we had discussed on the difficulties that we find with respect to not only defining clitics but also diagnosing clitics in the languages of the world. We had also introduced you in the previous module on the distinctions and similarities that exist between affixes and clitics. We had also pointed out to you how clitics in many contexts resemble words from which they are derived. In this particular module, let us now take you through a very broad classification that we have of the different types of clitics that have been recognized in different languages of the world. Now these different types are recognized based on various parameters. One of the of course most important distinction that uh, is spoken about in most textbooks on clitics is the distinction between simple clitics and special clitics. This distinction between simple and special clitics is based on the grammatical properties of clitics. Some scholars have also suggested that they must be renamed as phonological clitics for simple clitics and as morphosyntactic clitics for the special clitics. Clitics are also distinguished with respect to how they attach to their hosts. Just like we have prefixes that attach before their hosts, suffixes that attach after their hosts, and we have infixes that come within their hosts, we also find a three-way distinction in the world of clitics as well. So in terms of the attachment to their hosts, we find a distinction of proclitics, enclitics and endoclitics. Clitics are also distinguished in terms of the grammatical category of the word from which it is derived or the grammatical function to which the clitic is put to. So we may find pronominal clitics which are derived from pronouns, we may find prepositional clitics derived from prepositions, particle clitics like auxiliaries or negations etc. We also find classification of clitics which are very similar to that of affixes. For example, in the literature we find descriptions of verbal clitics. Now what are verbal clitics? Verbal clitics are like verbal affixes. These are clitics that appear on the verb. That is, these are bound elements which are recognized as clitics which take a verb as their host. We also find descriptions like adjectival clitics. These are like the adjectivalizing affixes. That is, these are clitics, the addition of which may derive a word into an adjective. Of course, there are also some minor types, like those which indicate speaker addressee relationship in the context of a discourse, etc. Let us look at these various types in greater detail. Let us begin with the simple clitics. Simple clitics are understood to be prosodically weak elements. By prosodically weak elements, we mean that there is a certain prosodic deficiency, something that does not allow them sometimes to get an accent, sometimes they cannot form syllables by themselves and therefore they must attach to some host and then form a proper syllable and gain sufficient weight to be accented so there is some kind of a prosodic deficiency or prosodic weakness. They are very often reduced forms of pronouns or auxiliary verbs. They of course require the support of an adjacent word. They are usually generally derived from some basic word classes and therefore they are said to belong to that word class.
Let us look at some examples. Look at the English contracted forms of the negative and the contracted form of the auxiliary verb. You have all used the apostrophe NT to refer to not. So you may say a sentence like they are not coming tomorrow or they aren't coming tomorrow. He is not there in the room. He isn't there in the room. Similarly, we know of the apostrophe VE which is used to represent a contracted form of the auxiliary have. So you may have a sentence like they have been singing for two hours or use the contracted form and say they've been singing for the last two hours. These contracted forms nt and uv are examples of simple clitics. And what is also important for you to recognize at this point is that most of the times simple clitics like the contracted nt or the contracted uv appear in the same syntactic slot as the full-fledged forms from which these are derived. So you say they have been singing for the last two hours and if you contract have into uv, uv appears at the same place where have appears and you get they've been singing for the last two hours. Just like you may say they are not there in the room, not and nt would appear in the same syntactic slot and you find they are not or they aren't. So simple clitics don't have the flexibility of moving from one syntactic slot to another. Let's move to the other type which is the morphosyntactically defined type that of the special clitics. Special clitics are considered weak forms of a grammatical category. They are very often restricted to appear in specific positions. They are different from full words because they lack the mobility to appear in different places in a syntactic structure. But they may also be different in terms of their syntax from their non-clitic counterparts. Let us look at the example of some special clitics from the Austroasiatic language Mundari where agreement markers are actually the reduced forms of pronouns. Now unlike the pronouns, if you can look at the examples now on your screen of the examples of special clitics from Mundari, what you find is that the agreement marker e, the agreement marker for I in the first example, Ranchi Ten Sen Kenre Sin Man Lel Keda. The, the agreement marker nya appears on ranchite or cinema, which is not the verb. In the second example, they are going here and there for a marriage. Adandi nangenko sen baratana. What you find is that the agreement marker this time for they is hosted by a preposition, not a noun. And in the third example on your screen, sukulenako what you find is that the agreement marker is hosted by the verb itself. So depending on different situation, you find that the agreement marker may not appear on the verb, but usually appears in the vicinity of the verb. It will either be on the verb or on the word immediately preceding the verb. But, but as far as the independent personal pronoun from which this agreement marker is derived is concerned, they are not bound to appear in the vicinity of the verbs. Now what is also important for us to understand about special clitics with respect and in contrast to simple clitics is that they are not usually derived by some kind of a phrase phonological reduction process. They are not affected by your speaking rate. What you have to understand is that the difference between saying they have been sitting here for two hours and they've been sitting here for two hours is that the reduction in the form of have is also guided by the characteristic rhythm of the English language and therefore the appearance of a particular clitic is also uh, affected by the speaking rate and the characteristic 
rhythm of the language. What we find is that special clitics are introduced in the syntax by a process of phrasal affixation. These are part of word formation rules that do not operate on words but on phrases. In that respect, we can very clearly see that the syntax of special clitics or the morphology of, simple, or of special clitics is that of the syntax of phrases or as uh, linguists have called it, it is part of the morphology of phrases. Another distinction between clitics that we briefly mentioned in the beginning of our module was the distinction that we find between clitics in terms of their orientation of attachment to their host. We had drawn your attention to how that's very similar to how we distinguish prefixes from suffixes and infixes. So when a clitic attaches to its host on the left, it is known as a proclitic. When a clitic is attached on the right, it is known as an enclitic. And when it is attached within a word, it is known as an endoclitic. Scholars have argued that this distinction of proclitics and enclitics is not really the same as that of affixes because what we find is that when it comes to affixes, the affix is already very particular about its host and therefore whether it attaches to the left of the host or the right of the host is not very uh, determining of the grammatical properties or the prosodic features of the affix. Whereas when it comes to proclitics and enclitics, what you find is that because clitics are free to attach to words of different grammatical categories or attached to hosts more as a matter of convenience than as a matter of principle, what you find is that proclitics would attach to the words that follow them and enclitics attach to the words which precede them. And therefore, it may be very necessary to distinguish in terms of prosodic representation how enclitics or proclitics are attached. The enclitic and proclitic nature of clitics may also be dependent and determined by the type of host to which they are attached. You have already seen many examples of enclitics from the Austroasiatic Munda languages. If you remembered, we had Ranchi Teng, Senemang, the Nya, which was attached at the end of those words they were your typical enclitics. So let us look at a few examples of proclitics. This time from a Mon Khmer language of the Austroasiatic family, Pnar, spoken in Meghalaya. In the examples that appear on your screen, you can see that you have words like Kasita, you have Yausapen, Waiba, where you see that the grammatical element of gender marking or morphological gender marking like ka with sita or u with mango come before the host and these are what are typical examples of proclitics in languages. The third type that we talked about, the endoclitics, which by definition seem to be very similar to infixes are not actually quite universally accepted by scholars. This is for the simple reason that clitics have often been defined in terms of their preference for peripheral positions. Do always remember that clitics are reduced forms of words in many cases. And therefore, when they are reduced in terms of their prosodic structure, when they become prosodically deficient, they need a host and it is at the peripheries that they find holes. And therefore, to recognize something as a clitic and as appearing inside a host is a very difficult proposition. Some of the examples that have been proposed in the literature are now on your screen. You can see that in the language Pashto, 
adachiste, you were buying it, the day is recognized as an endoclitic. Or the example from the Caucasian language udi in the word anexa, you find the endoclitic ne coming in the middle of the word. Another very important type of clitic that has been recognized for a very long time now is something which called the 2p clitics or the second position or second place clitics. These clitics were recognized by Jacob Wackernagel in the year 1892 as part of his study of the classical Indo-European languages where Wackernagel recognized various second position clitics in Vedic Sanskrit wherein what was observed was that clitics in some of these languages prefer to appear only in the second position of a relevant domain. They are of course special clitics because of their restrictions in positioning. In the way Wackernagel described them for classical Indo-European, we also find them to be defined as prosodically weak and dependent and clitics which are mostly phonologically placed where they are placed. So there are no syntactic operations, there are no morphological reasons for why the clitic appears in the second position according to Wackernagel, but merely phonological reasons why they appear in the place that, that they appear. Now this might be something that might sound to you as though it is something very strange. But what is interesting for us to note is that second position clitics are linguistically real. They have been observed in many languages. In fact, now scholars have expanded their understanding of second place clitics to also characterize it in terms of syntactic properties. Remember, for Wackernagel, they were merely phonological elements, but now Syntacticians have also started describing clitics in terms of the syntax of the languages. They are special clitics because they have variously fixed, invariably fixed position of occurrence. What is interesting is that in order to become a second place clitic or a second position clitic, Wackernagel's clitics or 2p clitics are seen to skip certain elements. Now what they skip is also interesting because it will not be the same for every language. Sometimes they skip a word and become the second element. Sometimes they skip an entire phrase and become the second element. Sometimes they merely skip a stressed syllable. Let us look at an example of 2p clitics from the language from Philippines, Tagalog. In Tagalog, 2p clitics are expected to follow the first stress-bearing word, as you can see in the example, Ganukanaba kakinis. How clever are you now? Now, as soon as the first stress-bearing word, Ganu, gets over, you find the 2p clitics. What is interesting also is that in Tagalog, most of these 2p clitics are ordered in a particular order, ka, na and ba are all 2p clitics and if they were appearing independently they would have all taken the second position. But when they come together they are also ordered relative to language internal principles. Moving on from 2p clitics to the set of clitics which are defined in terms of grammatical categories or grammatical functions we have one of the most commonly observed clitics, the pronominal clitics. Pronominal clitics, as we had defined them briefly earlier, are clitics which are directly derived from the personal pronouns in a given language. Now, what, what kind of derivation do they undergo? They undergo some kind of a prosodic weakening, something that is referred to as degeneration by some scholars. Some scholars refer to this as a process of grammaticalization. They develop 
from personal pronouns into agreement affixes. So what you find as pronominal clitics in many languages is actually a, a diachronic process of the evolution of agreement markers in these languages wherein personal pronouns which are later to become agreement markers are now seen in an intermediary stage of being pronominal clitics. It is a very necessary process that precedes the formation of agreement markers in many languages. We have to understand that agreement markers in languages do not come about ex nihilio. They are obtained from a particular source. Think about the Tamil examples where you have uh, uh, avan, our, our as he, she and they and the agreement markers irkran, irkrar, irkrar, the an, al and are being, being directly correlatable to the personal pronouns. Now in Tamil, of course, these agreement markers have fully developed into inflectional affixes. But what you will find is that in many languages, they are still in the process of developing such agreement markers from the freestanding personal pronouns. Many of the Austroasiatic languages, Munda and Mon Khmer, make use of pronominal clitics for agreement markers. And it's a very important process for us to be aware of, especially in terms of diachrony. That is, when we try to study how certain affixes come about in languages, what pronominal critics show us is a live example of the evolution of certain affixes in languages. Now you observe on your screen the example of Santali agreement marker. In Santali, as you probably can see from the example in Holang and Lena, the agreement marker, which of course is a clitic and does not appear on the verb go, appears on the verb word preceding the verb on yesterday as nya. You can also see that the nya is very clearly relatable to the independently standing pronoun in. What you notice is that the agreement marker clearly has pronominal origins. What you can also notice in the example is that the agreement marker is in some way a reduced form phonologically compared to the pronoun because the pronoun was ing and in the agreement form is just ny. You also find that the agreement marker is an example of a special clitic because as an independent word ing is quite removed far away from the verb but as an agreement marker, it is compulsory for ny to come in the vicinity of the verb. What is also observed in languages is that the position of pronominal clitics can also be determined by the information structure of the sentence. In these languages, what is observed is that pronominal clitics represent what are called highly topical information. Topical information is that which is given, which is old, which is expected. And when they choose their host, they choose a host which is highly focal. By focal we mean something which is new and something which is unexpected. What is also important for us to understand is that in every language, pronominal clitics may have a very default position in which they appear. Remember we have said that they are special clitics and their flexibility of movement is quite restricted. They do have default positions of occurrence but they may also have exceptions to these default positions in certain constructions. Santali or Mundari default position is the word preceding the verb but when you have no word preceding the verb in Mundari or Santali what you find is that the pronominal clitic appears on the verb itself. Now on your screen, we've given you some more examples to drive home this point, where pronominal clitics can be seen to have default positions and exceptions. In standard Romance and Greek, 
as you can see on your screen. The unmarked or the default position for the pronominal clitic to appear is preverbal. But if the verb is non-finite, like in the case of imperatives, or if it is an infinitive or gerund, then you find that the pronominal clitic is no more preverbal. In Cypriot Greek, we find that the position for the pronominal clitic by default is postverbal. But if your sentence has a factive complementizer, if it involves a subjunctive mark marker, if there is a sentential negation, if there are focused constituents or WH pronouns, the clitic is no more postverbal. In the same way, we find that in European Portuguese, the default position for pronominal clitics is postverbal. But then there are exceptions when it comes to embedded clauses, when the clitic has to appear after complementizers, or if the subjects are indefinite, or if the NPs involve focus particles, etc. So it's quite clear, even from examples globally and from examples from Mundari and Santali from Indian languages that while there is a default position where pronominal clitics appear, there will always be also exceptions where the default option is not exercised and the clitic may actually appear on the verb itself. Another very important and common category of clitics that we find is that of the verbal clitics. Verbal clitics are very similar to verbal affixes in that they are associated with the verb syntactically. The type of clitic that we were discussing just now, the pronominal clitics, is actually an example of a verbal clitic. It may not just involve markers of agreement, it may also involve markers of definiteness, that of tense and aspect, and also that of negation. They are usually bound elements, but they also exercise some degree of independence. Now, what is important for us to recognize is that if verbal clitics are clitics that are associated with the verb itself, then they are going to share many features with verbal affixes, which are mostly inflectional affixes. So, for example, verb adjacency. Verbal clitic has to come somewhere near the verb, just like an inflectional affix of the verb has to be found in the verb complex. It has to have some kind of a morphological or phonological attachment to the verbs. And we may also find that there may be presence of language specific co-occurrence conditions or restrictions. Thus, we may find that verbal clitics may have different positions of appearance depending on whether, for example, the given sentence is a declarative sentence, whether it is a yes-no question or whether it involves a main clause, WH questioning, etc. What you now see on your screen is an example from Kharia, a South Munda language spoken mostly in Odisha. This example, which is a translation of the turtle said, well said, take me along with you as well. We want you to focus on the different verbs. Look at the verb say. It is in the past said. So we find gamo. So the tense marker, the aorist past, appears as a clitic on the verb say. Similarly, look at the verb for take, dorebar. You have the verb take followed by the irrealist marker and followed by the second dual agreement marker, both of which are verbal clitics appearing on the verb itself. So these are the major types of clitics that are recognized in the literature. The minor types are those which are rare and we have not focused on them in our module, the, the kind of discourse particles, etc. Let us now conclude our module with a 
brief summary of the various points that we have discussed. In this module, we have taken up various types of clitics and also bunched them together. Simple and special clitics. They were bunched together based on their grammatical properties. Proclitics, enclitics and endoclitics. They are bunched together in terms of their orientation of attachment to their host. Pronominal clitics, prepositional clitics, particle clitics on the basis of the grammatical category of the word from which they are derived or the grammatical function to which they are used. Verbal clitics depend based on what is the grammatical category of the host of the particular clitics. What we also recognize is that where there are various discourse related clitics and also that affixes and clitics may share some of the subclasses that we recognize for one or the other. For more on the types of clitics, we encourage you to read the text of this particular module on the EPG Patshala website hosted by the UGC. We have many examples there that you will benefit from. The discussions are uh, given in greater detail and you will be able to not only appreciate the examples given in the text but also be able to recognize more examples of these types of clitics from the languages that you speak. Thank you.